thanks for coming and listening. It's a great pleasure to have people actually interested in what you might want to say on a Saturday at 11 in the morning. So today I'll tell you about aging versus immortality, mostly at the cellular level. Um, and uh, in the Collins Lab here on campus, uh, we have many uh, thoughts about aging and immortality, and we draw them out on our lab wall. So this is just a, a page uh, rendition of our faculty view. It's in one of our uh, lab uh, rooms. And so we, we try to think about how to stay young. Uh, the story today will take you from the molecular level of DNA strands <coughs> to the DNA strands packaged into a cell, the cellular level. So this is an example here of human cells that are in each one of these cultures, the media that's red. And then the story will go from this cellular level to multicellular organisms in these three stages. So the progression of today's story will first be about replicating the genetic code and in particular, about some special needs DNA ends. Then cell proliferation, which means the expansion of cell number. And also how this proliferation in multicellular organisms uh, is coupled to making those cells take identity. And then we'll get to the organism level, and we'll talk about aging as a countdown clock, and how this countdown clock plays out biologically versus immortality. And because this is science at Cal, at the end of each one of these sections, I'm going to show you an actual experiment. So you can ask yourself, how was this done? And uh, it will tell you about science at Cal. So to begin with the DNA. The DNA genetic code, as you most likely all know, has four bases. And these four bases are polymerized as head-to-tail chains. The four units, obviously, not that much information, but if you read the chain in groups of three or four, or five or six, pretty rapidly, you get to quite a complexity that can be encoded by these four bases. Now those strands, they have a polarity head to tail, five prime to three prime here. And in genomic DNA form here, this single strand is paired to another one, running in the opposite direction. And the pairs have complementary bases. So T always matches to A, A to T, G to C, and C to G. And these two strands then take this familiar right-handed helix, where one strand is here, and the other the base pairs are across the middle. So this is the DNA genetic code that we have. And it's important for today that in order to replicate this code, right, in order to pass this code on, this information content is easy, in fact, to copy because these strands are complementary. So you can imagine if you take the double-stranded genomic DNA and you split the two strands, this one and this one. In fact, this one alone can be used to polymerize the opposite strand because they're complementary. And lo and behold, this one can be used as a template to polymerize the other strand because they're complementary. So to replicate, you split the strands, you restore each single strand to double strand by polymerizing the complementary DNA units. So when I talk about DNA replication or DNA copying, that's what's happening. Now, this DNA genetic code that you have is in very long strands. In fact, here on this slide is your genetic code. All of it. One cell gave up its DNA strands to make this picture. So stand in blue are all of the DNA strands, each pair of DNA strands is called a chromosome. So one contiguous double-stranded DNA is a chromosome. And the image below was taken just when those chromosomes had replicated. So here's a double strand, and here's another double strand, but still paired to it, because the two parental strands just split, and each one got caught. So now there's this chromosome and this chromosome, and very shortly, each of these chromosome pairs will be split between two daughter cells, and one cell will divide to make two, and each cell will have a copy of the double stranded genetic code. Now, if you count these, as I'm sure Dan will do, you will see there are 46 chromosomes. And uh, 
In fact, our code only has 23 chromosomes, so 23 lost pairs. The reason, then, that there are 46 chromosomes is because you have a copy of 1 through 23 from mom and a copy of 1 through 23 from dad. So in fact, 46 chromosomes is good. Now, each chromosome here, just for scale, is about 1 1,000th the size that your ad could see. So they're small, right? And they have um, long strands, right? But you'll notice here in this slide that one particular sequence that is stained for in yellow here is present at every end. So these 23 chromosomes have different sequence content. But every one of them, in fact, ends with the same sequence that has been marked here in yellow. So this arrangement of uh, linear chromosomes is in fact not the evolutionarily <coughs> most simple way to transmit your genome. Here I'm comparing chromosome sizes and organizations of, of the, um, very greatly across biology. So an organism like E. coli, which is a member of the bacteria in this tree of life, it's unicellular, it has one chromosome. And in fact, that chromosome is a circle. So you can imagine that it's pretty easy to replicate a circle. You just keep going around. But in eukaryotes, yeast or fungi, plants and animals over here on this part of the tree, <clears throat> our chromosomes are linear. And in fact, the genome gets much, much larger, and the number of haploid chromosomes, that means from mom or from dad, is, let's say, about 20. It varies with the organism. But this means that, in fact, there are quite a lot of ends, and these strands that can be, you can get chromosome 1 from mom separately uh, from chromosome 2. So here, in fact, these genomes are very large, and in, in, uh, so most of the DNA in a DNA strand is in the middle. But the ends, in fact, are special. And these eukaryotic linear chromosomes have telomeres and segments that are uh, unique to eukaryotes. So here's a human cell telomere for you. Here, we'll blow up this bit right here at the end. And what you see is that at the end, there's a common sequence. It's a simple repeat of two T's, an A and three G's, repeated a lot of times, running this way, and a complement running this way. All those telomere repeats. And this bunch of telomere repeats here, present on each end, protects what should be an authentic chromosome end, the telomere, the stable telomere, from the fate that falls to DNA breaks, which are rapidly pasted together, shuffled, and they're kind of damaged. So it's, to not be recognized as random DNA breaks, not to be pasted together, our chromosomes need these genome caps. So this kind of end protective function requires, in fact, a little single strand overhang here on the three front end. We call it an overhang of the single strand on the top strand. But in the way that the genetic codes are rep is replicated, when you split the strands apart, and you make the complement of each to pass them to the daughter cells, you cannot replicate that. So this structure I've just told you is absolutely critical, and yet it can't be replicated by copying the other strand. And in fact, one would predict that with each round of chromosome replication, telomeres should get shorter. This is the blue of the chromosome continuing up through the roof, and this is the yellow part that's stained. Each time a bunch of divisions happens, this region containing the telomere should get smaller, smaller, and smaller. And in human cells, this loss amounts to about 100 base pairs, base pairs per n per cell. So this means a solution. And there is a solution. And that solution is a, is a special enzyme that is called telomerase because it makes only telomere. And what telomerase does is come to a telomere end here with this TPAGG three prime overhang, and it makes that overhang longer. It adds more repeats. This breaks the sense of dogma because the DNA is supposed to template the DNA. Okay? Only DNA gives rise to more DNA. And here I'm saying this DNA before didn't have these extra repeats, and this enzyme, telomerase, just can't add them. The way that telomerase does this is very interesting. I won't talk in detail about it, but it has a subunit that is both protein and one that is RNA. 
And the RNA subunit within it contains a sequence that is complementary to the steel nerve And so what polymerase does is it uses RNA instead of DNA to template the synthesis of DNA. And this makes it a reverse transcriptase. Transcription goes from DNA to RNA, that's the central dogma flow. This is the opposite. And they were, these kind of enzymes was thought to be unique to viruses. It turns out, in fact, that eukaryotes had it. So now we're at the end of this section, and I'm going to give you science at Cal. This is in 1995. Because this enzyme tomerase was discovered here by Carol Breider as a grad student at Liz Blackburn's lab when they were on this campus. How? How could you look for this enzyme? How could you have even thought that it could have an RNA template? Where would you look for this? So they looked in this organism here, which is by scale almost big enough for you to see, the ciliated protozoa, it's called tetrahymen. So tetrahymen has a lot of telomeres. And so Carol and I were looking in this organism to see how the telomeres might be maintained. And how you do that is you grow up a bunch of cells, you break them all in to make what's called an extra. <coughs> And what you do is you have a synthetic DNA mimic of this chromosome, a single strand of DNA. You also add radio labeled new DNA units, let that all sit together, and then you ask, did this piece of DNA get longer? And the way you do that is to resolve single strand of DNA by size. You take a big sheet of very thin jello, start all the DNA at the top, the positive electrode down here, and everything runs down here, and the things that are small go fast. So what you're looking at down here would be the size of the unextended DNA primer. And this is an, a radiograph. So what you're looking at here is the fact that that primer got long by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, by continuous series of this is a telomere repeat, and another, and another, and another, and another, and another. And so this enzyme could make these telomere repeats on this single strand of DNA without a DNA template. It's carrying its own. So this is how Brian um, <coughs> Blackbird found telomerase, looking in a ciliate for telomere maintenance. And this um, discovery then, at first, wasn't clear how relevant it was going to be to other organisms. So I'm going to take the progression of today's story, point number two, and tell you about cell proliferation and cell differentiation in multicellular organisms. The slide of the human cell chromosomes illustrated the fact that telomeres shorten with each cell division. Now, in this slide, I've been more uh, specific, and I've said telomeres of human somatic cells. So, this is an experiment where you take any cell from your body, like a skin cell, you put it in a culture dish, and you let it grow. And as a function of, uh, as of time, you come back and you look for these telomeres. And here, starting at the beginning of that cell division, it's like uh, growth, you can see that telomeres were long, right? But if you let them grow for a while and they proliferate and make more cells, in fact, the telomeres have gotten shorter, and so on, and so on, until they stop growing. They stop growing because they don't have enough of that end protective cap to keep the chromosome stable. And the cell says, no, no more, no more cell division. You don't have enough telomere. So in fact, this came to be termed the telomere mitotic clock. Because up here, the length of telomere you start with you can grow, no matter almost what it is, but every time you duplicate and divide the cell, this countdown clicks off. There's a mitotic clock. Mitosis is the cell set, uh, division that limits the renewal capacity of these human cells. So hang on a sec. I've told you that tetrahymena has um, telomerase, a mechanism to maintain these telomeric repeats, and yes, if you grow tetrahymena in culture forever, it will maintain a certain length of telomere within a range. But 
cells from multicellular eukaryotes, like humans, like these skin cells right here that are to scale. You put those in a dish, you ask them to divide, and they lose telomere until they halt proliferation. And depending on the cell type, they either kill themselves or they just sit there and wait. <coughs> so, wait, how, how can humans have telomerase if telomeres are always shortening? In fact, it was a challenge, a challenge to find telomerase in human cells. Because no matter how many purifications of normal cells during culture you do, there's no enzyme. So what's the solution? How do we know the human telomerase even exists? The answer to that lies in cancer. Because when these normal somatic cells shorten the telomere, if something like a viral protein expression or mutation lets them continue to have, they have very short telomeres, they go through a replication cycle, and all the chromosomes start fusing. And there are rampant cycles of fusing and breaking, fusing and breaking. And this rearranges the genome. It's called genomic instability. And in the process, genes get turned on and off. And at very, very low frequency, a cell can survive this. And if it does, and if it activates telomerase, it can become cancer. So a cancer cell will grow out of this, and it will maintain stable telomere lengths because it is apparently active. And it is thanks to these cancer cells that human telomerase can be identified. In fact, human telomerase was identified in HeLa cells. How many of you have heard about HeLa cells? Okay, great. So these cells were, uh, they are a cell line started in 1951 from a cervical carcinoma from a cancer. Back in the day, people were trying to grow human cells. You can imagine the frustration. You take a cell from your skin, you put it in a dish, it grows, and then it stops. And the raging controversy was, well, is just the growth media not right, or do human cells just stop? And so uh, it was in the process of continuing to try to grow different kinds of human cells that this line from a woman named Henrietta Lacks, it was abbreviated HeLa, uh, grew. And these um, individual HeLa cells are shown over here in phase contrast. They're just for scale again, about one tenth the size of what you can see by eye. So we have these cells, they're on the bottom of a plate, right here. There's the tissue culture plate. My student Alex is going to put these cells in the hood and, uh, and uh, open this open this dish. But where he got that from was this here. So this is what our incubator in the lab looks like, with the right temperature and carbon dioxide for the human cells to grow. And you can see that there's a bunch of these plates of cells. So these cells grow indefinitely. And that's why we can grow them today, when they started growing in 1951. And in part, that's because they have very high telomerase levels and stable telomere. So if it had not been for HeLa cells, in fact, we would not be able to grow human cells in culture, and we would never have found telomerase. And so these cancer cells, for a very long time, were the only model for human cells, uh, uh, studies of telomeres. And this can't be true, right? Because we don't have to have cancer to have the next generation. So again, there must be some other way to have telomerase on and maintain a human cell telomere. And the answer, comes to this point about the fact that we are a multicellular eukaryote. And in multicellular eukaryotes, like us, our body cells, those somatic cells, they don't actually go to the next generation. You can't put your arm in a cooked dish and get another people. The somatic cells here, the vast number of cells in your body, they actually don't grow forever. But if you think about it, when a few cells are set aside very early in the development of a human into what's called germline, meaning they will go to the next generation, these germline cells have very few divisions. Then uh, egg and sperm, gametes, will come from these germline cells to make a cell that's called a zygote, zygotic genome. And this cell will make a bunch of cells, in fact, here, in purple, that are the early cells of the embryo. 
And after proliferating for a while, those early cells of the embryo will decide to make all these somatic cells. But very early in that process, some are set aside to be germline. So in fact, the germline gamete production here in red, there's only a few cell divisions. And in fact, telomerase is active in some of the early germline cells. Huh. Early embryogenesis, okay, here this purple cell, uh, in fact has many, many cell divisions. Because if you think about it, you're starting from one cell, and you have to make an entire organism. Small, big, bigger, and there's a lot of cell turnover. So in fact, it's these cells that would be the ones that should have telomeres. But these cells, human embryonic stem cells, weren't possible to culture in the same way that HeLa cells can be cultured. A cancer has learned how to grow no matter what is around it. But normal cells, well-behaved cells, don't do that. So they're harder to culture. In fact, it was a big challenge for scientists to develop human embryonic stem cells. Um, but uh, my colleague Derek Hoffmeyer here at Berkeley is a master at them. So here's science at Cal, number two for you. These are human embryonic stem cells, or uh, BS cells, in culture, can be grown. And I'm showing you an experiment here to end this cellular proliferation cell. You can take these cells and isolate their genomic DNA. And if you take that genomic DNA and you chop it up into smithereens by cutting, for example, at every GATC, most of the genomic DNA has GATC frequently. In fact, you mix it up a couple of few things. But the telomere repeats are constant. T, T, A, G, G, G. These enzymes don't cut the telomere. So the only thing that's left is telomere and DNA. So then you resolve this DNA by length. Here you leave a base pair, but it's the same. Here's the top, here's the bottom of that gel. And things that are faster are smaller. Here's a scale, times 100 base pair length, right here. So this is a strand of 2,000 bases. Now you can detect in this resolved DNA the telomeres by taking a little radio-labeled oligonucleotide, this sequence, and you denature all of this DNA, you split the strands, and then you let this base pair with the telomere. So everywhere there's a telomere sequence in the DNA, resolved in this gel, you get this signal on the artery. What you can see is you take wild type, unmodified human embryonic stem cells, and you grow them and grow them and grow them for these days of culture. These telomeres are staying pretty much the same. But if you take telomerase out of those cells, no telomeres. Now you can see the telomeres short and short, just like the telomeric cell. Okay? And eventually, those cells get to short telomeres and die. So, embryonic stem cells do, in fact, in a human, use telomerase. And it's the embryonic stem cells maintaining their telomeres that gives, that solves the problem of are somatic cells not. And I'm going to come back to that. So, I want to come to this third point here in the progression of today's story. So I told you that cell proliferation, this expansion of cell number, can happen with telomerase, in which case telomeres are maintained, or not. But in humans, and most multicellular organisms, if you take rapidly proliferating cells, like the embryonic stem cells, and you switch their identity, you tell them to become a somatic cell type, which you can do by changing the ES cell culture media, they differentiate, so they get an identity, skin or blood, bone, and when they do that, they turn off telomeres. And they're still proliferating, but now they're doing it shortly too. So this sets up this question. In, a, in the sense of aging at the cellular level, in a multicellular organism, how much of the cell division is a countdown clock, that mitotic clock counting down each division? And how much isn't? Can we, to what extent, do we have cells that are immortal? So I'm going to do, for this, a back of the envelope calculation for you. Because on that last slide, we'll say that these telomeres are 10,000 base pairs. Okay? You start off with a stem cell. Back of the envelope calculation, 
And you assume that the human body has 50 trillion cells, and about 50 billion of those are replaced per day. If we make 50 trillion cells and replace them, right, how much division would that take? So if you lose 100 base pairs per m per cell division, and you start with 10 kilobase pairs, and you end with a shot tumor can't get much smaller than 3 kilobase pairs, that's 70 divisions. So if every cell divided is maximum number of times with no cell death, wow, that's a ton of cells. That would be more than for a uh, long, a uh, long, long somatic cell life. But <coughs> each differentiated adult cell type Right, can only be generated from a certain lineage of things called adult stem cells. So the embryo has embryo stem cells. They can become anything. But very early on, when you lose those, there aren't cells in your body that can become any kind of cell they want. We have stem cells that are more restricted. They can make a blood stem cell can make blood, gut stem cell can make gut, skin stem cell can make skin. Okay? So we start off with a fixed number of those. Embryonic stem cells turned into these adult stem cells. And these adult stem cells have a certain telomere. Right? So there, ever, ever after that, if you want to make a lot of skin, you're only as good as the telomere like in that adult stem cell. So they're set aside. And furthermore, telomere shortening is often more than 100 base pairs. And again, it's just random stochastic events. And in fact, in any given cell, there are many telomeres, but it is the shortest telomere that will stop proliferation. So only one of them needs to get short, and then the cell has to stop. So really now, let's reconsider how relevant is this telomere shortening in the human somatic tissues. And to illustrate this, I am going to use the adult stem cells that come from blood. Okay. The adult stem cell that comes from blood is called a hematopoietic stem cell. There will be a quiz on this later. <laughs> no, really. Uh, here is HSC. The point of this is that it's one cell living in the bone marrow makes uh, two types of descendant adult stem cells. So this is an adult stem cell. It further makes two kinds of things that are more restricted. One of them goes on to make a whole bunch of cells that I deleted from the slide, including red blood cells. So only as many, uh, you can only make as many red blood cells as you have these, right? But on this side, this one here makes a lot of cells also. This is a simplification. The descendants of this one on the lymphoid progenitor are different types of white blood cells that fight infection fight different kinds of infection in different ways. And they fight basically anything for it. And so you can see here that this common lymphoid progenitor, it made the B cell lineage, it did all kinds of crazy things, it made a T cell lineage, it bounced around, it became all kinds of different things. So you can imagine that, in fact, we might have a few of these cells, some of these cells, these, and then Maybe you use up your long-term memory T cells, right? Well, you can't come over here to this stem cell and ask for T cells. Can't do it. Okay? We can't make more hematopoietic stem cells, and we can't turn this back. So, low telomerase activities present in a few adult stem cells, but in fact, none of them <coughs> can prevent telomere shortening. Now, fortunately, the hematopoietic system of stem cells divide very slowly because this one only has to divide twice, one of its daughter cells can decide to be this progenitor and make all this stuff, and the other one can stay with stem cell. That's what it means by the answer. So if, if this divides once a year, and one of its daughter cells goes to make all this blood for a while, then it can be another year before it comes back and divides again. So these stem cells divide slowly. These ones, there are very few of them, but they divide slowly in a normal, environment. But, let's say, in your circulating blood, you deplete blood type by chronic infection. For example, if HIV gets all your T cells, or EVB gets all your B cells, 
or you have a deficiency that destabilizes the red blood cell. Now, what happens? Okay, the signal, got no B cells, okay, goes back to the stem cell and tells it to proliferate more. So through all kinds of events, particularly chronic infection, you can make the cell proliferate chronologically more uh, rapidly, right? If there are more divisions per any given amount of time. And you can, in fact, then think that you might deplete these cells. So who you really? And now, uh, in order to ask this question, one could take peripheral blood mononuclear cells, basically, for the other lymphocytes, isolate them from the blood, and ask how long their telomeres are. But instead of doing this with the DNA lot that I showed you before, in fact, there's a way to do this so that each cell is counted differently. It's a flow machine where each cell flows through, and as it flows through, its telomere length is recorded. So each dot on this graph is somebody, a different human, who had their peripheral blood mononuclear cells analyzed for telomere length. And the average of the telomere lengths in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells is shown as a dot. So if you look with chronological human age at just healthy people, you notice two things on this graph. The first is that there is a decline. In fact, that decline is estimated to be very high in the first year of life. It continues at a high rate, it's only about four now with more data. It tightens up a bit, and then declines very slowly over all of adult life. And is that average or shortest? This is average. So here, um, you, can, you can at least imagine that a, a young child has more cell proliferation to do. The body has to increase in body mass as well as renew itself. Right? So there's a higher proliferative demand up here. Also, very young kids are shaping their immune system and there's a lot of cell killing going on. So it makes complete sense, in fact, that the rate of loss is very high in the and then so it's down. So the other thing to notice about this graph is that at any given chronological age, there are a lot of dots. Yes, there's a line through this. But different people have very different average telomere lengths in their blood cells. And this is proven very true. So just because you're 40 doesn't mean you have a certain length. Part of this can be environment, like whether you have chronic infection. But part of it is also genetic. So telomeres do shorten with age, but there's a wide variance. So, is this too much telomere shortening? How would too much telomere shortening manifest in human? What would it look like? And now we get to science at cow. <laughs> science at cow's lab. Now we're in 1999, and we're in my lab. And we were using HeLa cells to study telomere rings because we could grow them. And we were identifying what was in that enzyme. And we kept scratching our heads because it didn't really make sense. Now you can't take a human and knock out a gene and ask, well, is there no more telomerase? But what you can do is go to the population and ask, are there people in the population that maybe have a mutation in the gene I'm interested in? A reverse genetics. Instead of making the change you want, you look for the change you want out there. And in fact, there were cells from patients that have a disease called dyskeratosis congenita, or DC, that had been mapped to have a mutation in this protein we thought was important for telomerase. So we asked, well, is that, can that be true? And in fact, if you take, now this is, again, that DNA block where we've run the DNA out by size and we're hybridizing the telomere fragment. If you take a parent, let's say this is a 45-year-old parent, uh, mother, and you look at the telomeres, that makes sense. This is right here in the middle of this range. That's about right, age-appropriate telomere length. But this is her seven-year-old son. He's seven. No, he was older, but teenage, basically. And what you'll see is that these telomeres are very short. They are very short. But they're strikingly short for age. They should be up here. So in fact, in we can show that in dyskeratosis congenita, the disease, 
there is less telomerase at all stages, including that group, at about a quarter or half of its normal level. Okay? So what we learned from this and from subsequent studies by many groups is that if you just half the amount of telomerase, you have bone marrow fit. You take it down to a quarter, you have bone marrow failure in your teeth. So in this blot, genomic DNA isolated from the blood cells, chopped it up again, resolved DNA to size, look at the telomeres. These telomeres are so short that these cells shouldn't be proliferating. And in fact, they weren't. And it was really hard to do this experiment because trying to grow these cells was frustrating. I had to speak with Jay Mitchell, and he kept trying to grow enough to make this blot, and, and it would die. And he put it in the back burner. But in fact, now we know why. We know why, because these cells had such short telomeres. Because the people had grown into adults with so low telomerase that um, they had come to a telomere trial. So um, since then, in fact, there have been a lot of uh, other mutations that have been linked to this kind of tear telomere shortening in humans. <coughs> and there are different extents of telomerase loss. And there are different ways in which you inherit the mutation, and many other differences that give a spectrum of defects in phenotype. And um, all of them, though, are in things like blood cells and in the surface body layers that divide a lot. Skin, nails, hair, lung, gut, all of these things have to renew constantly because they're exposed to the environment. They have very high proliferation rates in the so it makes sense, in fact, that if you were going to run out of telomere <coughs> and certain cells were going to suffer and not be able to divide enough, it would be blood cells and <coughs> epithelial lineages in the surface body layers. So I'm just showing here a graph. If you take telomere length in normal people as a function of age, it has a wide <coughs> variation. In fact, there's a wide uh, difference among people. So you can plot what's here. This is the telomere length for someone, let's say, 70 here. This is the 99th percentile. You are very long telomere. Okay, here's the first percentile. Not so good. So if you look at this normal distribution, and then you plot the telomere length of um, people with these diseases, these characters of congenital that I taught you about, told you about, and some others. In fact, it's now a diagnostic criteria for these diseases that the telomere length is short, is below the first percentile for age. And the shorter the telomeres are, the younger the age of disease onset, right? The, the uh, telomeres become short. Now here, only when this person is three, they're the short, right? And here, it took them until they were 60 to be that short. So a lot of missing telomeres for the but there was a, a, another thing beyond the level of telomerase that really makes this different. And it makes telomeres different as a type of inherited gene difference. And that's a fact called disease anticipation. So disease anticipation means that in the subsequent generations, either the age of onset gets earlier or the symptoms get worse. So here, in her increasing shades of purple, are earlier onset of worse symptoms in patients. And here's a grandfather, right, who has a mutation that cripples telomerase, but the chromosomes have long telomeres. And remember, there's so few divisions in the germline that this person can get by, make some sperm, pass it to the next generation. But this child inherited both the mutation and shorter starting telomeres because without enough telomerase, you couldn't reset. So in fact, they have fewer years of somatic cell division before they have disease. And yet again, in the next generation, inherit very short telomeres and the mutation. And this is the most severe one of those diseases on the previous slide. This is very early. So you can imagine now what might happen if in this cross, male, female, gave rise to son, there had been another child here 
who hadn't inherited mutation, but had inherited short telomeres. You got a normal genome, but you inherit from your parent telomeres that are too short. And fact studies are beginning to show that those people also get disease. That it takes more than one generation to bring your telomeres back to normal. So it's a very uh, unique sort of way to think about disease. But besides the, the, the uh, rare diseases, they also, I assume, show uh, early signs of uh, premature aging. These diseases. I'm going to come to normal people in a We're not on the aging. So, yes, these, in this case, this, these uh, are characterizations of disease. So, just one slide in between, point about that. And here, I'm just going to show you one slide of mice. So, this I took from, uh, I took, obviously, this from public magazines, not the scientific literature. The mice are from the scientific literature, from the Pino lab. But if you start with two old nieces, if you read the mice, so that they, they, mice have actually very long telomeres, very small body size, very short lifespan. But if you rig the mouse such that it's got human sized telomeres, okay, and no telomerase, it will look like this. This mouse looks a little scruffy. It's missing hair patches. It's got bone hair probably too. And if you put telomerase back into that mouse, that mouse is sibling. <laughs> now look, my, with telomerase, the mice are young again. The activation of telomerase of aged nieces rejuvenates the higher level. Now this is somewhat true. But again, this mouse, like the humans that I talked about with this characteristic congenita, they were sensitized by gene disruptions in telomerase. Now out there in the population, there is a great variation in, uh, you're never plus or minus. There's a great variation in how much tolerance you might have. But it's a fair question how these studies, which tell us that short telomeres can limit lifespan, they can limit tissue renewal, how does that relate to telomere length in the general population as a function of age, which I think was your question. And furthermore, you know, in part, the jury's out on that. Because how much telomere, you know, is this enough over here? But you can imagine that at least in some people, under some circumstances, on infection, for example, you do use this up. You use up your telomere reserve. So then it begs the question, why turn off telomerase in the first place? If you're going to be able to use it up and, and have bone mass. Is anybody able to measure the shortest <coughs> length of the shortest chromosome? Sure. Yes. Why don't you show charts of that? Because this data is a much larger data set. And my point with this data here is just that there's a lot of variation. So the question is you already said that it's the shortest telomere that stops itself from growing. Why are you showing average telomere? And I'm showing average because it's the Thing that's more readily measured in the general human population, and average telomere length is a pretty good predictor of the distribution. So I'm going to come back here now to the end of the story, the progression of today's story. Because this aging countdown clock, we could ask, does it have a function versus an immortality of these somatic cells if they could continue to grow? And the answer that I have to that is in this graph which I downloaded from the National Vital Statistics Reports <laughs> um, from the United States uh, deaths up to 2010. We're looking at the year here, and basically uh, deaths in the human population in the US, these are US ones, from different causes of death. And the top causes of death are on this slide, and what you can see is that diseases of the heart, they mean heart attacks, have been going down steadily, in fact, along with these cerebrovascular diseases, which is stroke. So if you have too much cholesterol in your arteries, you know, you're going to have a problem. But in fact, with the advent of statins and more knowledge, this disease rate is going down. So that's not telomere limited, because actually lifespan is going way up. So you should run out of telomeres. More. 
now in, in, a, in a more recent data set. But what you can see here is number two cause of death are malignant neoplasms, in other words, cancer. And this rate has not gone down so much. And if we humans are going to die, partly of all kinds of things, Alzheimer's down here, one, but one major thing we're going to die of is cancer. So perhaps evolution has selected to let, to prevent, to add protections against cancer. And what is commonly cited and is very true mm -hmm. is that cancer is a disease of aging. There's a sharp increase in cancer incidence with age. You can see that here, age at diagnosis. I actually separated out the male and female cases. You can see that everyone's getting more cancer with age. If you take the overall rate, it's here. There's actually a little bit of dip in very old stages, but uh, very little cancer, and then more and more and more. And it's not linear. This is because in order to become a cancer, in fact, the cell has to accumulate many mutations. So there's time, there's more time to accumulate these mutations. And therefore, cancer becomes a disease of aging. And in fact, this disease of aging, I would argue, is a good reason to not have to walk this back in somatic cells. So here's an illustration of how sequential mutations are required to create a tumor. This is a picture here on the top of a normal epithelial cell layer, red and white. And it's sitting on this yellow stripe, which is a basement membrane. So this layer, you can imagine this in your lung or colon, is doing a very good job of making a barrier, and it's going to absorb nutrients or air across. Those cells know to make one layer. They stop growing when they touch it. But you can imagine that one of these cells acquires a mutation, and that mutation tells it to divide more than normal. Okay? So in the first mutation, now the red this little cell right here, it's kind of red, became a lot of cells that were red. But still, that cell is obeying the instruction to grow in a monolith. But you can imagine that the second mutation happens to one of these cells in here, and that second mutation lets them grow on top of each other. Okay? This is this is honest. This is how cancer happens. And these guys now they can grow on top of each other, right? But they still can't get out of this epithelial circuit. They're either in your lung or in your colon. So in fact, another mutation, you can imagine happening here, that lets them degrade away that basement membrane and sneak into endothelial cells and spread their body. So lots and lots of cell divisions are required to accumulate mutations, to divide a lot, to become uh, mutant. And in fact, a lot of the mutations are going to cause cell death. And in fact, a lot of these cells are going to be killed by your body because they're behaving inappropriately. And all those white blood cells are become ill. Uh, and so they also have to acquire the, an evasion of cell death. So there's a bunch of hits, multiple hits, that it takes to make a cancer cell. This could sit there 10 years, become this, become this, become this. And in these cancer cells, though, this unrestricted growth is essential. It's essential to maintain the cancer as bad for you, and it's essential to get there in the first place. So for that reason, you can imagine a balancing act in the steel nerve. By turning off telomerase in somatic cells, there's a limitation on this unregulated cell growth. A cancer cell might divide for a while, might become a benign tumor, but if it stops by itself, it's actually not going to kill it. So this tumor suppression occurs from turning off telomerase in your tissue. Because, in fact, most of us don't die of bone marrow. And so it uh, limits lifespan to some extent, or in some people, under some conditions. But overall, it provides a tumor suppression mechanism. Because reactivating telomerase is just another mutation that has to happen in those cancer cells. By removing telomerase, you have one more hurdle they have to pass to keep growing. But in the beginning, I mentioned that in cells without telomerase, human somatic cells, that get short telomeres, 
manipulate their epithelial cells. They stop growing, but they sit there. And eventually, if they get induced to divide and have genomic instability, very infrequently, they'll generate a cell that survives and is activated to telomerase through the genomic rebrain. So in fact, short telomeres imposed by turning off telomerase are tumor promotion also. And so this balancing act, you can imagine, of how much telomere you should have to not restrict growth, uh, to how much telomere you should have so that you limit growth, and how much telomere you should have so that you don't induce, encourage cancer, there has to be a balance. So what would an ideal solution be if you think about this for a minute? The ideal solution, you don't have to be telomerase positive. You don't have to have active telomerase to keep growing. You just need long telomeres. So the ideal solution you might imagine would be to pulse telomerase on to elongate telomeres and then turn it off. And if you elongate telomeres to be able to meet the future demand for proliferation of that cell and then turn it off, you get all expanding descendant cells and all, though, all of them are more resistant to cancer. And lo and behold, that is what human development does. So telomere shortening, human somatic cells, but the much smaller number of cells in the germline and the many, many cells in early embryogenesis gain long telomeres. They reset each generation, unless you're compromising the telomeres genetically. And in that manner, tumor shortening can provide telomere suppression. So here's a graph of telomere length as a function of age, with lines kind of starting here. So maybe in this range is the human population genetic variation in your telomere lengths in your germline. And you can imagine that starting from either end of this, these germline cells know where to put their telomere. They put it at a certain length, let's say 10 kb. And then early on in fetal development, they turn telomeres off. And they can't maintain the telomeres anymore. So then, in further development, infancy and childhood and adulthood, demands for cell proliferation are counted. There's a lot of proliferation here, but here in adults, in fact, so, in this range, the safe zone, where telomeres can support somatic cell function and not contribute to tumors. And here, what's just shown is in the germline, where there's not proliferation, over time, because these cells are not dividing, they keep their telomeres. And so, these germline cells go on to make the next generation and start to expand. So, in fact, in a multicellular organism, Turning telomerase off in somatic cells probably is a mechanism of tumor suppression. And um, it's interesting to think about then this population variation, and also interesting to think about how this relates to medicine. Because you can imagine that if you're an adult over here and you get chemotherapy, it wipes out your blood cells. And those somatic stem cells have to launch into action again, right? You're asking them to repopulate an entire immune system with the telomere lengths of the immune system in an adult. Also, if you're thinking about a bone marrow transplant, for example, if you take bone marrow from an adult here, you transplant it, it's starting off with fewer divisions. So there are um, applications of this towards therapy for some screening for telomere length to inform choices of therapy. Um, and I think in the future, uh, through embryonic stem cells and through adult
proliferation, it's just the process of dividing that shortens telomeres. There are some situations, human genetic uh, defects actually, in the end capping proteins that allow more degradation per cell cycle. But those are very rare. So really what's controlling your telomere length is just two things. Whether telomerase is on to put the telomere back each cycle of replication, and how many cell divisions the cell has undergone. Because if it only divides a couple times, telomeres are still long. So it's, it's number of cell divisions. There's some cells in our body, like the neurons, the heart muscle, that don't divide. They're essentially the same from birth until 80, 90, 100 years old. Do they have short telomeres or not? And if they have long telomeres, do you think that telomerase accounts for all human aging? Or do you think there are multiple parallel pathways that all have to be attacked in order to achieve immortality? OK, there's two questions there. <laughs> the first question is, uh, I mentioned that in adults, there are adult stem cells. There are other cells that are they're, they're committed to being a certain type of cell. So there are cells in the brain, not exactly stem cells, but that's arguable, where um, they're creating brain. And the brain cells are not turning over at the same rate that our gut and our lung and our skin and our blood is, because they're just not coming in contact with toxic, you know, insults in air. Uh, so, tumors do shorten in all tissues with human age. However, I think that what things like this characteristic can, can generally tell us is that where the tumors get the shortest are in things like blood, not in things like brain. The other question is, is telomere shortening the only thing that's responsible for aging? And, and obviously, I think not, because uh, some... I think, personally, not, because I was very careful to say aging of tissues, aging of, of certain cells, and mortality at the cellular level. I don't think that if we all took a bunch of telomerase and magically somehow activated telomerase in our tissues, we'd live forever. But I want to point out that that's a very tough thing to achieve. Because if you think about it, in the blood, in all of the cells that are there, they're just the worker bees. They're going to die in a month. What you need to have telomerase on in is the hematopoietic stem cell. Now, it's not dividing, and there are very few of them. So in fact, any telomerase activation therapy would require getting to those stem cells so that you have the capacity to repopulate this tissue over a long time. And that's very hard, and that's where I think being able to get adult stem cells, find out what they are, or make them from human embryonic stem cells, grow them up in, in a dish, put them back, that might be the only way to really reverse that. If I'm not a doctor, I would like to say that no one should take any medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> so I think in a way this ties in uh, to your question, but different animals live different lengths of time. Right? Uh, a mouse lives two years or 18 months, and a human lives 70 years, and an elephant lives 100 years, and a turtle lives So we learn. All right, so this question is, uh, lifespan does vary among mammals, even closely related mammals. So the inbred mice live two years, but there are some rodents that live 10 times that long. So within evolution, lifespan is clearly changing. And it's not changing in proportion to telomere. So for example, mice have telomere, inbred mice used for these genetic experiments, they have telomeres that are five times longer than humans in lifespan that's only two years. So there is a correlation, though, between lifespan and body mass. For some reason, things like elephants and us that have more cells, we have a longer lifespan in general, if you uh, put a few organs in that plot. And you could imagine many things for that. It just it needs to be longer for time to reproduction. If you're but you can imagine that if you're multicellular, if you're big, the value of tumor suppression is enormous if your body mass is large. So there could be, uh, some people say that there are much better DNA repair mechanisms 
in large animals that have long lifespans. And it's not only, um, basically, you know, if you suppress mutation, then in fact you may live longer. And so there's some argument that some of that has to do with better DNA. You mentioned uh, chemotherapy. Are there, uh, is there interaction between um, antibiotics or other medicines with specific types of tumors or specific targeted cells? Okay, so the question is about antibiotics. Antibiotics are antibacterial agents. So they kill the bacteria, mostly, that are invading you. And those bacteria, like that E. coli, that's one chromosome that's circular. So they have absolutely no telomere. So the way that those antibiotics work, I mean, their direct mechanism of making you healthier wouldn't actually, no, no telomere. Okay. If uh, somebody finds a cure for cancer, should we all get injections of telomerase? If <laughs> somebody finds a cure for cancer, this is going to be a good thing. Uh, should we all get injections of telomerase? Well, I would. <laughs> That's not medical advice. <laughs> you hear all the time about foods that are healthy for you, etc. You, you can't tell. But is there anything that you come across that you think we should keep to our minds? Question is about food and that's so far above my molecular and cellular level of expertise that I will refer you to the literature. <laughs> Since cancer cells create Activate, yes. Is cancer actually Ah, okay. So that's a very interesting question. Could you repeat it? Yeah, yeah I'm going to repeat it. So one problem that we have is the exhaustion of cellular language. Let's say we run out of white blood cells. So a cancer cell, let's say it's a leukemia, right? It activates telomerase, and now in your blood there are in fact a lot of white blood cells that are cancer, but they're white blood cells. So the question could be, well, could that actually help you? Could those cancer cells give you something that could compensate for what we've lost? And to my knowledge, the answer to that is no. It's a good question. If you could force the cancer cells to turn back into something normal, maybe. But the cancer cells have so many different mutations. They have come to a completely different lifestyle that, that they don't really provide any, they had to lose their identity. They had to say, I'm not a monorail cell. I don't know. I don't know. Good thought about it. If the cancer cell is there and has a lot of telomerase, uh, cells don't live alone in a multicellular organism like us. So could telomerase leak out of the cancer cell and affect, in any way, the surrounding cells? And um, the way that our cells are organized, you couldn't do that. Because a eukaryotic cell, a bacteria is a cell wall, and the DNA is in there. But in eukaryotes, there's two compartments. There's the outside of the cell, and then the DNA is within another internal compartment. And so telomerase is acting inside a compartment, inside the cell. So in fact, if the cell breaks open, or if, or if the cell takes up the way that cells take up things from their environment, which they do all the time, we would never get back to the eukaryotes. But interesting idea, in general. Stress seems to be related to cancer, right? Do you see anything in these mechanisms that might help to explain the relationship between stress and cancer? The question is, is there a connection between stress and cancer or even stress and telomeres? And Liz Blackburn, UCSF, she was at Berkeley when she did science at Cal, um, and now at UCSF. She has been trying to investigate that um, by looking in the population at stress versus telomere length versus cancer. And I have to say that's a very hard thing to do. These epidemiological correlations are very tough because 
many variables go together, and the and variance is wide. And so I think the jury's out on it. But it's possible because stress induces DNA damage, or stress can also induce DNA repair. So you can imagine, you can imagine intersection. So just I think the data's out on. Uh, yes, there's a mechanism that uh, resets the algorithm for each new generation. Is that mechanism perfect? I mean, does the average algorithm like, for population stay the same generation? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting next to you. <laughs> uh, so the question is, do the embryonic stem cells, when they're, when they're in an embryo, right, uh, how well do they know what they're supposed to start? Because what I said, that whole graph, relies on the fact that those embryonic stem cells, they know where they want to be. Because if they don't go to that, right, then, then it's kind of random how much length there is afterwards. So that's a, we don't know the answer to that question. But Derek and I would bet, I think, that they have very tight uh, sense of what the set point is. And the previous models for this, of course, have been the cancer cells. Now, the cancer cells, you know, if you overexpress telomerase or do various things to them, their telomeres will change. They maintain their telomeres, but the length that they're sitting at will go down. So the, the paradigm is, well, there's not set point that's controlled, but it's very good. And we think that probably that's, that again, is maybe something that the cancer cell had to do to become a cancer. And so I think I think there's going to have to be two in when Dick gets his tires. So, um, the other thing is, is with telomerase, how does it know when to stop? Like, yes. like it's adding more uh, telomeres, yes. so <laughs> but it, it, it has to know when to stop, right? So, Susan's question is, how does telomerase know when to stop? Because equally to the cell knowing where it wants to be, right, the telomere structure actually helps the telomere know how long it's supposed to be. Uh, how does telomerase, it goes to an end, and maybe it only needed to add three repeats to get to that length. But maybe it needed to add 300. Right? And in fact, if you do have damage of telomeres and they lock off a big piece, they go back, they grow much faster. So telomeres is adding more. Uh, so how does telomeres know how much to add? Boy, my little have spent trying to figure that out for <laughs> a really long time. And we have a, we have a theory now, which is that um, the length of the telomere changes telomere structure. I won't exactly explain how. And in fact, that change in telomere structure changes telomerase script on DNA. And that is our favorite model at the moment. Two concepts here. One is aging, and the other is longevity. So how does your research apply to that? And I think we also so I think this question in general, if I can rephrase it, is the difference between longevity, which is lifespan, and something that we call health span, which is how well your tissues are performing. And lifespan, you know, I think uh, is partly genetically determined. There's a variance in the population. But there are, there are, you could argue that we're, most of us are not getting to our lifespan. So that increasing absolute maximum lifespan is going to do really nothing for our health. Because if we're losing healthy function of our tissues by living, what does that help us? And so I think, I mean, I, I think that there's a great uh, debate to be had about that in the medical establishment. And, and not knowing anything, really, about the cost of therapies and things like that, um, I will leave it to them. But it's, that's an interesting question. Mac. Um, so you said, I think, a few times that telomerase gets turned on and turned off at certain ages. Do you mean that it's turned off for our entire organism, or just for certain of these stem cells? <laughs> that's also a very big question. Uh, so, and one that the hook my lab's trying to figure out. So there's, I say on and off. And there are, your question goes to the fact that there are different ways of turning it on and off. So, in the embryonic stem cell differentiation to 
adult stem cells to cells in your body. The way in which it's turned off is a real off switch. The genomic DNA, basically, next to telomerase genes, becomes non-permissive. And the cells parrot that. They parrot that non-permissive state. So it's not that you can take a signal from the outside and turn it off. <coughs> you can't, because even if you did that signal, it would still be off. But it's possible that there are intermediate states. So we know about that one. We know about that because we take skin cells, and we can ask what it will take to turn telomerase back on. We just we can't do it. But then if you take certain kinds of T cells, some of those white blood cells, and you do the same thing, well, they'll turn it off. So there must be just a few, there are probably a few adult cell types, stem cells, highly functional cells, that haven't turned it off quite so much. But we have to have much more molecular insight about what these on and off switches really are, so then we can go look and we can say, was this off off or is this just kind of off? So back to the cancer cells, uh I believe the cancer cells don't actually make more telomerase, they just keep it turned on, right? The question is, do cancer cells make more telomerase or just keep it turned on? Well, so they came from a cell that had none, that had turned it off. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, and it just told the DNA, and you can't make any more telomerase. So the way that they, again, turned it on wasn't a normal way. It's not the same way that an embryonic stem cell does it. It has to be a way that's specific to cancer. So in fact, recently, and using DNA sequencing of cancers to look at what kinds of mutations drive certain kinds of cancers. And there are some mutations in that same region of the, this DNA is off switch, that are very common in certain types of cancers. So the idea is that cancers are driving to farms to turn on, but it's not exactly the same way it's turned on. It's a different way. So the cancers are very different, and their level of farms is very high, and What's limiting the telomeres is very different, and so this one too. I just take a couple more, and one more, two, and then we take one more, and then you can ask me afterwards. Yeah, go ahead and go ask. I've read that researchers have been able to uh, transform somatic cells into stem cells using simple chemical cocktails. Have uh, the telomeres of those stem cells, is that true? And have the telomeres, if so, have the telomeres of those cells been examined? Okay, so he's asking if we take an adult cell with a fibroblast and we rejuvenate it into a chloropotent stem cell, that's right here. You can't do it with the cocktail of chemicals. That turns out not to be correct. Uh, there are ways in which you can do it that aren't yet at the point of uh, clinical therapy. But I think that um, when, when this happens and the cells divide, yes, telomerase goes back on. And when it goes back on, it goes back on in the same way that the embryonic stem cells, so it's returning it, in fact, maybe to a more normal on. But if the jury's still out, whether these clear stem cells have the same kind of telomere length set point knowledge that these embryonic cells Good question. And thank you all for your questions. I'll, I'll stay and I can answer any more if you have questions.